Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you, and from The Op, also known as USAopoly, and from GameNerds.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, Episode 704. Why is for yelling? Not into the mic, though, because I'm polite. <laughs> Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Jeff tries to get us to stop. We answer questions about mystery boxes, silly voices, and business concerns, and we get back on the alphabet train with our top 10 games that start with the letter Y. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Yosemite Sam of board gaming, Tom Vassell. I don't, I don't want to be Yosemite Sam. You call me varmint all the time. Yeah, I don't think I've ever called anyone varmint. <laughs> <laughs> the vassal varmint. Uh, it's that fiery hmm. temper of yours. I think, and this is going off track here, as we often do at the very beginning. Yeah, uh-huh. I liked, was it called Back in Action? Oh, uh, the Looney Tunes Frazier? Back in Action? Yeah. Yes. I. First of all, I really liked that movie. I enjoyed it. There was some silly moments. I mean, there's always silly moments. There were some, maybe that were over the top. But I liked uh, Steve Martin in it. I liked, you know, the different characters. And I really liked Yosemite Sam. It's a brief moment, and he showed up in the uh, saloon. I, I think I blocked out the existence of this movie. You don't like it? I, I, I don't even remember if I've seen it or not. Oh, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. I mean, I don't know how well it's aged. You know, I think the special effects aren't very good anymore. But hmm. I'm a big Looney Tune fan. So, yeah, anyhow, sure. my name, though, is Tom Vassell. And my name, though, is Eric Summerer. I don't know why I had to repeat the though part. I... All right. Well, welcome to the Dice Tower. Um, today, we have lots of things to talk about. I do want to mention that our Kickstarter is it's over now, but we do um, have our pledge manager running. So if you backed us on our Kickstarter, go fill out the pledge manager um, on GameFound as fast as you possibly can because I need to uh, order things. I have a sample puzzle I believe by the time you hear this, I'll have it in my hands. Ooh. I was surprised, Eric, at the number of puzzles people wanted. Interesting. Yeah, that seemed to be very, very popular during the campaign. It was incredibly more popular than I thought. Huh. So go figure. And I'm This actually... is a jigsaw puzzle of the, the dice character image of, of all of the dice characters on a shelf. Really cool. I think it's a really good image for a puzzle. I, I understand why it's so popular. Sure, Tina does a fantastic job. And so I mentioned this, folks, because if you miss the Kickstarter and want to jump in, just go to DiceTowerKickstarter.com. If it, it's At some point this week, we're going to redirect that to point to the Pledge Manager so you'll be able to um, jump in if you want to. Speaking of jigsaw puzzles, I have a the, I got the newest Exit game. Oh, the ones that include a jigsaw puzzle. I'm, I'm fascinated by these. Yeah, I haven't opened it up yet. Um, I got two, but I gave one to Z. Hmm. He wanted the easier one, (laughs) so I took the (laughs) harder one. Uh, Although I found that the exit games to me, and this is maybe it's just me, I've always found them to be wildly inaccurate on how difficult they are. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so hard to to scale these things because if some particular logic puzzle is just not in your wheelhouse— or you're just not thinking in that direction, it can be, to you, much more difficult than uh, than it was to the designers. Also, don't forget, folks, we have another uh, sister podcast, Dice Tower Now. Always listen to that for the news, quick, uh, succinct news, and other things there, including Dice Tower Dish, uh, where Corey talks about and interviews different people over a meal. Hmm. Now, a lot of great interviews. And then Dice Tower Digest. We have a newsletter where I, you know, all this stuff... All these news announcements about Dice Tower, that's a place I put them. All righty. Well, with that being said, let's talk about some games we play. We just mentioned Exit. Eric, you played a slightly longer escape room game. A slightly longer escape room game. Yes, this is one that uh, Suzanne talked about a few episodes ago, a while ago, but I finally got a chance to bring this to the table. This is the latest in the Escape Tales series. This is called Children of Wormwood. Uh, It has a very spooky cover. 
Um, but it actually isn't as spooky as I, I think. Uh, like not comment. even a little. They made Makes it sound it like be. it was super spooky. Right. Every once in a while, they're like, there's cultists. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, whatever. Mo- moving there's on. There's these mysterious vines. Don't touch them. Yeah, that's about it. Um, it. It is an adventure story, much like others in the series. Uh, the Escape Tales series has you exploring locations represented by cards. It's sort of a grid, and you have action tokens that you will then spend. You, you put an action token down on a card. It says, I'm going to explore this quadrant, and it leads you to an entry in a booklet. Um, and uh, you'll read the entry. It'll tell you to pick up a card or, or solve some sort of puzzle or enter something into an app. There is a, a web-based app that uh, runs this game. They are entering in and uh, answers to all of this. The story of Children of Wormwood is that you are an adventurer, and in fact, there is a uh, there's a character associated with you. You have an actual avatar. Um, what's his name again? It's oh Wyatt. Is that right? I don't remember. It's the it's it's this this guy. You're you're it's very generic guy. <laughs> a character. Um, and they they have stats like sanity and focus and stuff like that. And as you complete tasks, solve puzzles, or get into trouble, you'll affect these stats. They'll go up or down throughout the course of the game, and that will affect how the story branches. Um, this has the the same style of puzzles that um. Uh, that you you would be used to. And now I'm, I'm remembering, Tom, you talked about this as well. Um, and it is, I think, up to par with the other style of, of logic puzzles in this series. They, they are a little tricky, but they're all very sort of observational puzzles. I like how yes. the app will tell you how many cards you need to solve a puzzle. Um, there's no limit to the number of hints you can do here. You could go through all the hints, and there's no penalty whatsoever for doing so. Um, which is great. I, I like that. Um, but the first thing it will do when you just load up the puzzle, it will say, here are the number of cards you need. You need four cards to solve this puzzle. And if you only have two, well, then you know you, don't, you can't do anything with it yet. So you keep exploring. Don't, don't rack your brain trying to solve the puzzle. But you're combining items. You can combine items together and have um, your character look at an item by t- combining the two, and, and you'll sometimes get a clue or an observation, sometimes just a snarky comment. Um, ultimately, it all boils down to a whole bunch of endings, and a lot of them are based on those stats that you get at the end of the game. Uh, you know, is your sanity above 10? Yes, no. Is your focus above 6? Yes, no. And that will lead you to a final text-based finale uh, when you're all done. But then there's tons of other paths. You could have gone a different way, solved different puzzles, affected your stats, not beaten up the guards earlier in the game, all sorts of stuff. And um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of cool to have that amount of replay value. And in fact, the app will let you explore other avenues at the end of the game without having to play through the game again. You can just sort of like, here, if I answered these questions differently, where would that go? Which is kind of nice if you just want to explore all the Right, you can just quick look at them all. But to have it all sort of boil down to what are your numbers at the end of the game? I don't know. I would much rather have it be, which puzzles did you solve? Which I guess ultimately it is. But when it's stat-based at the end and it's a numbers game, I don't know. sort of left me a little dry. Um, I I did still enjoy it. I still want to play more of it because I think there's a lot more to explore. You can go through this game and not see a significant portion of it, which is very cool. Uh, I played this solo, and I think I'll probably want to play it with when, when the group gets together, which is on the horizon. I'm, I'm looking forward to playing this with them because there's more to solve in Escape Tales, The Children of Wormwood. Well, there's a couple things here. Um, the Yes, the, you, you, you don't see everything, but there are going to be puzzles that are choke points. Like some puzzles you're just going to go, I, I, I'm pretty sure, some puzzles you're going to see no matter what. I think so, especially so, ones early in the game. Right. And even some at the end of the game, you're going to run across the same puzzle at a certain point. And if you found something in this game, you can find items and things. Mm-hmm. It's going to be kind of hard to be like, um, let's not find a thing this time. <laughs> let's just ignore this. Yeah. One thing I do find a little lacking with this particular one is there are you combine things in this game. They 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 took a page out of the unlock series, mm-hmm. and that's fine. That's an interesting concept. I don't mind it. Although I will say it's a little more cumbersome to do so. 
to type the three number digits in right. three times? Every card has a three digit code and you have to enter. So you're entering six digits every time you try to combine something. Even and it's when in you're... a web browser. So it's just yeah. not, it's not an easy task to do yeah. as simple. But if you get stuck on a puzzle, Eric mentioned, there's lots of hints for that puzzle. There's no hints on what to combine with what. Hmm. So you could get stuck in that regard. I yes. got stuck at some point, so I just brute forced it. I was like, all right, I got 15 items. I will <laughs> combine every things. item with every item. And then actually there can be some negative effects if you do that. So keep an eye out on that. Yeah, be careful. But the other thing is, and this is, I'm, I'm trying not to spoil, but there's a pretty big game changing thing that happens in the third act. Yeah. And to do what you need to do in this, it's a fascinating thing that you're doing. But there's also no help in this regard either. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yep. That final thing. You can't look up a clue. It's very open ended, and you can't. I mean, yeah. You you could try to brute force that one. I did that too, but that um <clears throat> has a few more than fifteen times fourteen options. Uh. Um, yes. There is there's so, some exploration, let's say, uh, in the final yes. act, and and I think I think there is more. There are Easter eggs. I'm I'm convinced there is a, in that maybe, final but I'll tell you what I was I was disappointed that that wasn't as interesting as I thought it would be. Okay. But either way, I still think it's good. I still think the first one's the best. It just has such a depressing theme. Uh, it's true. I really want I want to have a a light happy theme. I would like bunnies and rainbows in the next Escape Tales. I don't know if that's be bunnies and rainbows. Well, I want to play with my like kids. A, that, that's what I'm saying. I like an adventure game, you know. <laughs> my kids looked uh. at the cover of this because it's it's a woman like lounging in a giant stone hand that is rising up out of the ground and covered with these evil vines. It doesn't look happy go lucky, and and so my kids saw the cover and they're like, nope, and not doing that. I wouldn't. I don't even. I don't know that the gameplay is necessarily even for kids, Eric. No, the puzzles are, they're they're deep. They're, there's these are thinker puzzles for sure. All right, well, uh, about six or seven, I don't know, maybe it's eight months now. It's been a while. Walmart yeah. decided to sell Marvel United. <laughs> Slightly ahead of the Kickstarters getting their copies. Slightly. It went over fine. Everyone was totally chill Nobody about. cared one way. <laughs> well, <laughs> finally, finally they delivered the Kickstarter. Here's the thing. They did deliver the Kickstarter in two waves. You get the, yes. the base game and then all the extra stuff. So I got the yes. base game from the Kickstarter months and months ago. I did the as base, well. The base game comes with six heroes and three villains. Oh, wait. There might be more than six heroes. Maybe it's eight. It might be eight. Yeah. Uh, it might be six. Though. Yeah, I'd have to look at the box. But if you back the Kickstarter, you have 27 villains and 58 <sighs> heroes. It's insane. It is so many little figurines. Eric, I played everything. Did What? I... I did it with my kids a few times, but I sold the rest of it. I played every hero and every villain. I played them all. I just got my box, like, earlier this week. How did you have time for this? You must have gotten it faster. Not not particularly faster. I got it Friday. Okay. And then Saturday, I didn't have anything to do. So. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and also, when you're playing solo, you can really turn these around. Yeah. Okay. They're not long games. We're talking 20, 30 minute games sometimes. Oh, uh -huh. well, sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. My win loss percentage was about 50%. All right. It would have been higher if I had not been just playing random. By random, I mean I just grabbed, here's the next three heroes. <laughs> I was playing three heroes at a time. Here's the next three heroes. Here's the next villain. And sometimes it's a villain who you should be using a lot more fighting power against. Right. And I didn't bring any heroes that did that. So that would happen. If I could pick my heroes for villains, I would say my win percentage would be around 70 because some of them are very hard. All right. Now, this week, if you go to our YouTube channel, I'm actually made a series of videos where I'm ranking all the heroes in my order from favorite to least favorite and villains. Same thing. And I'm reviewing all the expansions. But I will say this. Having this extra stuff really opens the game up a lot. Yes. I really like... I like the original game, but it felt like I wanted some more variety. Having all these villains 
so much fun. Just the the Kickstarter extra box alone is insane. It's like two layers of figurines. Right. But outside that, I can just tell you right now, if I was going to get one expansion, I would get the Sinister Six for Spider-Man. That's the it, one I didn't get. Oh, then don't watch my order of villains from favorite <laughs> to least favorite. <laughs> Actually, I didn't get the Sinister Six and I didn't get the Thor pack. That that's the one, Those are the two I was like, no, I'm spending too much on this already. I will yeah, pass on those. Don't look at my favorite heroes either then. Um, <laughs> I wanted Spider now, Pig. That was all I needed. No, Spider, Spider Ham. Pig is... Spider Ham is... Is quite low on my hero list, but I want um, a John Mulaney figure. That's all I needed. Nah, see, that's that's that that's a deep cut, Eric. You shouldn't allow stuff like that to affect your enjoyment of games. I really, I'm I'm, I'm very excited to have a John Mulaney make. No, that makes no sense. John Mulaney does not voice him while you're moving him around the board. Maybe not for you. Yeah, not for anyone. I don't think John Mulaney plays this game. Anyhow, um. I would recommend, folks, when you can get the expansions. Well, it's on Kickstarter right now, so if you missed anything, you can. Oh, they're can doing get another it all. campaign. They, they said all that stuff. They're, they're doing the X Men version now, mm. but all if you missed all the stuff from the last one, you can back that. I see. So, anyhow, it is a lot of fun. So, if you don't know what we're talking about, folks, it's a cooperative Marvel United. It's a cooperative game. Well, if you get the X Men version out right now, you can play one versus many, mm. but. Um, it's a cooperative game where you can play one to four heroes against a villain. The heroes are different. They're not as different as you might think. They each have a 12 card deck with a, most of the time, three special cards and then different stats on them. You will have the villain will play a card from their deck. You'll play a, three cards from heroes and then the villain plays a card. And you just keep going till you defeat the villain or the villain defeats you. Villains have, Different victory conditions. They always have one where if the villain goes through their whole deck, they win. But they also they often have alternate victory conditions. Almost every villain does. Heroes uh, are have different icons they're playing. You're fighting off thugs. You're rescuing civilians. You are stopping the villain's threat in different areas in different ways. And eventually, you get to a point where you can fight the villain themselves. And then you go try to beat the snot out of them on, before they win the game. Some villains are really straightforward. In the original base game, Red Skull is a very straightforward villain. Yes. Other villains like Loki, and I'm not saying he's a great villain. Don't feel bad if you didn't get the Thor expansion. But <laughs> <laughs> Loki gets stronger and stronger until you you got you got to beat him as quickly as you possibly can. There is so much variety in this game. It's I liked it when I first played it, but I really like it now. Uh, I mean, I'm a big Marvel fan anyway, but I f I feel like I know the game pretty well at this point. Yeah, Bob, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's currently my most played game of 2021. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm really enjoying it. It's a lot of fun. And I know I get it. You know, people say, oh, I didn't back it for all that Kickstarter stuff. I got to say, it was a pretty good deal. If, if, if you just backed the game with all the Kickstarter stuff. Right. My word, that's a good deal. You didn't have to add on anything. And you got a ton of extra stuff. So I guess there's that. You you have that chance. You're hearing the review right now. Yeah. The X-Men set seems to be even better since many of the villains can also be played as heroes. For example, Magneto can be a hero or a villain. Interesting. And you, they also have the way where someone can play the villain. Now, I don't know that playing the villain um, is that exciting. Like, I usually like playing the one in a one versus all game. Here, it wouldn't bother me to not play that. Okay. You know, it, it, was, it was fine. It worked well. But, I mean, I'm okay with the game also being straight co-op. Some of the villains, I don't know. If I, Thanos is so hard. Okay. I guess that makes sense, right? Yeah. But, but it's funny how hard some... Like, I found Rhino to be pretty hard. While hmm. um, well, Carnage was really hard. I have a... Was this sheet here? I have a sheet on my desk somewhere. Where I wrote down every combination and all my wins and losses. <laughs> yeah. was some there was one like I I think it was Carnage. Halfway through fighting Carnage, I was like, I don't think it's possible for me to win this thing. Yeah. And it was not. And then there was one like Loki. I was like, hey, hey, you're dead, Loki. And then we died. <laughs> but this is not a 
you know what gets me excited about this, folks, is it's a fun cooperative game that is not overwrought. Hmm. I'm so tired of overwrought games. I mean, there's a time and a place. Don't get me wrong. You know, to look for games that have all kinds of things in them and stuff going on and, you know, a big complex game. This is not big and complex. You have a six-card threat deck for the villain, a 12-card deck for the villain, and then 12 cards for each hero. A few tokens, a big... You're supposed to put these cards in a circle, but you really don't have to. Yeah. You know, you can just put them in a little line, and even that, you could you could even make a discard pile and just look at the last three cards. Right. Um, it's not a big game. The minis are in are useful because they show you where your characters are on the six location board, but it works. It's smooth. The kids can play it. It's fun. I think it brings out the Marvel flavor, and games aren't long. I I, I really like it. So you've not played with the new stuff yet. I haven't played with the new stuff yet. No. Do you think but you can get your kids to play this? I, I'm trying. Um, my kids are being rather difficult right now when it comes to board games. They would rather play the video variety, and so they will often pick the shortest game on the stack when I'm like, which of these three do you want to play? Well, how long are they? I will play the 20-minute game. And So give them three groups of Marvel heroes to play. <laughs> yes. Make that their Would option. you like to play with the Spider-Man set, the Thanos set? Yes. Well, that's don't start them off with a Thanos set. That will no. be depressing. Okay. Anyway, that's Marvel United, folks. My next game to talk about is my my new current favorite uh, word game, or at least my my new obsession when it comes to word games. This is available on Board Game Arena, so I've played it there. I haven't played the physical version of this. It's called High Clue, and that's spelled H A I C L U E. Uh, is this a play on Haiku? I maybe, yes, and and I guess. You know what? I think, yeah, probably is a. I'm uh, asking a you. On, I don't know. It wasn't a leading question. It probably is a play on haiku, and I'm, I'll explain why in a second. Uh, publisher of this is Tiger Board Games, and the designer is Will Leaf. Uh, the reason why I think that makes sense, Tom, is that this uses word tiles that sort of look like those magnetic poetry tiles that people put on their fridge, uh, ah. sort of white rectangles, and and they've got words on them. You are presented with, this is a competitive word game. Um, you are presented with four words in the center of the table. You will be randomly assigned one of those words. Uh, there's, there's sort of symbol cards, and you get one of those. And so one of those is yours, but you might not be the only one at the table that has that word. So anybody can have any of the four words. You then have 15 of these word tiles in front of you, and you have to choose at least two of them to make a clue for the word that you have in the center of the board. Uh, and, and you can combine them in interesting ways. So you can just put two words next to each other. That's a simple clue. But you could also put two there and then two below it, sort of group them together in small phrases um, and, and use as many of the tiles as you want to make your clue. Then you reveal and everybody then guesses uh, which of the four words they think each of the clues are. You get a point for everybody that guesses correctly for you and you get a point for every one of your correct guesses. Pretty simple. Uh, and you play a number of rounds and see who earns the most points. What I like about it is it, it it's very simple, quick. It, it moves uh, at a good pace. But it also has some very tricky decisions when you're presented with these 15 tiles. And sometimes none of the words that are in front of you are matching your word. Or they match pretty well for your word, but they match even better for one of the other four. So how do you get the clues to be arranged so that they preclude the, the words you don't want them to guess, but lead you still toward the, the, uh, the word that you need to guess. Um, it has a little bit of a code names uh, feel to it, and you're trying to avoid certain words but keep people focused on one. Uh, I, I really like it. Um, and the Board Game Arena version allows you to play what's called turbo mode, and I fact, in fact, I recommend playing it that way if you, you try it out, where you um, everybody does all of the guesses in one go, and then it's all revealed at once. If you play standard mode, everybody guesses on one word, and then it gets revealed, and then one word, and it gets revealed. If you're playing turn-based, it, it doesn't, it's not moving fast enough. I really like it. This is one I think I want to track down a physical copy of to, um, to, to bring it out at family game days, because I think, I think the family will really like High Clue. Thumbs up. Hmm. Huh. I'm not, I have not heard of this one. Okay. All right. Well, the next game I'm going to talk about, folks, is one I think Eric will like. Mm-hmm. 
but I am not sure, and I hate being so so vague about this in some ways, I'm not sure how I feel about this game yet. Oh, okay. So it's called The Initiative. This is from Corey Kinezka, and he started a new publishing branch of Asmodee called Unexpected Games. Hmm, Corey Kinezka was once the lead designer of uh, Fantasy Flight Games. Mm-hmm. And so this was really exciting. If, if you look at the art on this, I, I, I think everything about this would appeal to you, Eric, because the the game is a series of missions and it the rule book has a comic in it about four kids who find a mysterious game called The Key. And they're okay. playing through this game. They do not get sucked into the game oh. or have things come out of the game. But stuff happens. Um, not... It's not supernatural, It's but but something's going on. There's a mystery behind the scenes okay. type thing. And so the way the game works is each mission of this game, you are going to place, and I'm, and I'm giving you just the base rules. The, the game is like a legacy game almost or a campaign game as rules will get added and it changed and things. And you'll get a card, and you stick this card in this reader that has a bunch of things you can flip up and look at parts of the card. And there's these clues scattered around the board, and you need to go around and uncover these clues so that you can flip up these different face-down things and, and discover, like, if I find a certain symbol that looks like a box with two dots in, I can flip up all the, the things on this clue card that show that, and they might show the letters T. And I might need to uncover a word, a, a phrase. That's easy. Eventually, you might uncover some letters and then unscramble them to get a word. Or find a bunch of numbers, and you have to figure out what the last number is because they're all in a sequence. So you got to find enough clues to figure out what the sequence is, and then guess what the, you know guess the final one in that sequence. As soon as you can guess whatever this thing is on this card, you win that game. And if you guess wrong, you lose, or if you run out of time. That's the that's the concept of the game. The playing of the game. Has you there's a deck of cards that are numbered from one to twelve in multiple suits, and at the very beginning of the game the suits don't matter. So what you do on your turn is you can take two actions. There are four different actions you can take, and one action is move, one action is uncover some clues in the board, another action is taking those clues that you've uncovered, and you play a number card on an action to take that action, but it must be higher than any other number cards that have already been played there. The fourth action, if you play a card there, you can remove all the cards off one of the other actions. Hmm. So you shouldn't play a 12 on something, for example. Right. Because then you can't play anything else. So you're trying to play as low numbers as you can. Um, If you have a really low number, you want to save that for the uncover action because you definitely don't want to play high numbers to that one because you could run out of actions. Each character also has special actions. You can discard two cards. When you go through the deck, and you'll go through it pretty quickly, you reshuffle it, and then you shuffle in some time cards, and when three time symbols show up, boom, you're done and you've lost. So I played through, at the time of us recording this, I played through, I think, six missions. Okay. There's a lot of ciphers in this game. I like ciphers. There's secret clues and codes. I like that sort of thing a lot. When I was a kid, I used to mess with this stuff, you know, like I would read like the th- that, the three investigators and other books um, about ciphers and things. And I enjoyed that a lot. Mm-hmm. And this has a lot of that in it. It's great. Like when we were, you know, we flat out cheated in one game. I don't know if it's cheating or not. You tell me if it's cheating, Eric. I was playing with the kids. We had a bunch of letters. We were missing two letters. And we're like, well... We had it. We hadn't. We had a rare letter in our word. Uh huh. One of the letters that doesn't show up in many words. We're like, man, we should be able to because uns- you had to unscramble the letters. We we didn't know what to do, so we uh, called my wife in the room. She looked at it for ten seconds and told us what the word was. <laughs> Is that cheating? She's in our family. That's a, it's a cooperative friend. game. You're fine. That's not cheating. <laughs> You still had that lifeline, right? I guess. And then she's like, what game is this? This is very interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I like that aspect, right? Like you don't have to find all the clues. You just need to find enough to get to a point where you can say, okay, it's an eight-letter word. We found six of the letters. Okay. I think we know what the word is. Hmm. Now, some of the things, though, you have to find pretty much all the clues to do them. I'm not as intrigued with those. I like the ones where you can try to guess earlier. 
Hmm. And then there's other things. Like I said, the game changes. It does some typical things that you might find in an escape room game. You don't destroy anything in this, but let's just say there's there's surprises here. <laughs> okay. I don't know how I feel about the game because I really like the half of the game that's the escape room stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't care one whit about the, the game, uh, about the playing the cards. Yeah. I feel like we're doing that just to get to, like, all right, fine. Okay, you move here. You do this. Okay. Oh, you found a clue. Okay, great. Oh, we found a clue. Great. Flip a tile. Ooh, let's all pause and think about what this word yeah. might be or the sequence of numbers. Okay. Now, I get that they, they, they really built something unique here. It's definitely a unique, interesting game, the initiative. But I I don't know. I mean, hmm. I think some people are going to like it. The I I I've read or watched every review on it so far and they're they're a little mixed. You know, and so I've I've given it to the other guys in the studio and I want them to play it too cuz my kids think it's fantastic. Huh. All right. They they don't have any complaints at all. I mean, they complain when because the clues are kind of put out in the rooms randomly. So for them, it's not fun when they're looking for that one clue and it's the last room you go to, which you may not get to in time. Right. Right. Yeah. But I don't, I'm not with them as far on that. Like they love the comic book part and the story behind it. And that's, and I, I like that part too. I just like the puzzles and I almost wish the game wasn't there. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, 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 I get the, uh, that perspective and I, I wonder if I would feel the same way. I think I, I would need to see, how engaging the game is, the game portion, uh, to see if it makes up for having to do that to get from puzzle to puzzle. I know you would like the puzzle part. Okay. I mean, because of what you just said, almost of the of the high clue, it has that same kind of feel to it. Okay. But um, there you go. That is the initiative, hmm. and I think I think that's enough games for today. Sure. Can we stop? I think I think please please stop. We we should really know when we should stop. And 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 we have someone who can help us figure that out. Three, two, one, go. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein, where we find out how games really work. As more and more people get vaccinated against COVID-19, there's a glimmer on the horizon that we would be able to resume game groups, local conventions, and the large national events like Gen Con and Dice Tower Con. It's been a long time, and for many of us, our conversational skills have become rusty. Or for those of you like me, maybe they weren't that great to begin with. Well, fortunately, science has come to the rescue. A paper published in early March looked at how people talk to each other specifically how people stop talking to each other. And the research was performed by a team from Harvard, Wharton, and UVA. They performed two experiments. In the first, they asked 800 people about their most recent conversations, whether it was with a coworker, family member, or friend. They asked them a series of questions about it, mostly focusing on whether they wanted the conversation to end before it actually did, and how much before the real ending that was. In the second experiment, the researchers took 250 people and randomly split them into pairs. They then asked them to have a conversation about whatever they liked for how as long as they liked from one to 45 minutes. They then asked the subjects when they would have liked the conversation to end and to make a guess about when their partner wanted it to end. So what did they learn? First, the number of people that had a conversation where both said it ended when they wanted it to was really small, only 3%. About 30% ended when one person wanted it to end, but not the other. And in about 50% of the cases, half, both parties wanted the conversation to end sooner. Now, on the positive side, in about 30% of the cases, the conversation ended when one person wanted it to, but the other wanted it to go even longer. And about 10% of the cases, both participants wanted to talk longer, but stop sooner. So... Most of the time, though, the conversations went on longer than both parties wanted, and usually by a lot. On average, people that wanted the conversation stop sooner thought it should have been 50% shorter. It was twice as long as they wanted. In one sense, this isn't really surprising. We've all been in conversations we want out of, and some of the more self-aware among us, myself included, 
have sometimes had a dawning and horrifying realization that the other person really is not interested in hearing about why you love board games. But in another sense, this is really surprising. I mean, talking with another human is something that we do all the time. We've been doing it since this we first began talking. How is it possible that we are so bad at not knowing when to end a conversation? Now, it should be noted, of course, that the study was conducted with Americans. Do other cultures do a better or worse job at conversation? That's an interesting question for a follow-up study as well. Researchers also speculate that this awkwardness in knowing when to stop a conversation may be part of the reason we like some structure to our social gatherings like meeting a friend over coffee or a meal, then we have a definite framework for when to wrap things up. Board games bring a similar structure to interaction. They guide what we're talking about and typically have a definite ending point. Some even constrain when and how we are allowed to communicate. Anyway, when you get back to having face-to-face -face conversations, the science says you should probably bail out sooner rather than later. And so I will take my cue and end here. Looking forward to seeing many of you in person soon. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. This is fascinating, Eric, because I feel like I'm, I might be one of the people who's in the conversation and, and the other person wants me to stop. Mm. I, I fear, I fear that whenever, like if anybody brings up board gaming or any other subject that I'm like really nerdy about, like... Somebody brought up the Muppets on Twitter. A friend brought up the Muppets, and I, I like, went off. I'm like, oh, yeah, I talk about Muppets. I am ready, sir. And, and I almost got this sort of, whoa, oh, yes, interesting. Thank you. Okay, bye. Um, so, yes, I, so I've sort of started looking for that glassy-eyed stare. I try and look for it as early as possible. Sure, but I think, I think though, that folks should think about how – we should try to listen to other people. Mm. I'm certainly guilty of when I'm in a conversation with someone, even on a podcast, <laughs> I'm listening to the other person, waiting for them to finish so I can say what I'm going to say next. Yes. We, we, many people tend to do that. I was really discouraged when I first came back from Korea talking to people about Korea because someone would say, you were in Korea? And they would ask me a question. And I'd be like, oh, wow. And then I realized two sentences that they were no longer interested. <laughs> and people are not usually interested in things that they don't know anything about. So mm -hmm. I have tried to, and I'm not perfect at this by any means. If I meet someone and they say, oh, I do this, this, and this. I'm like, oh, I don't know anything about that. I don't even know if I care about that. But let me let them talk about that a bit. And uh, let me try to listen as hard as I can because that will make them happy. Yeah. I think you could also, uh, if you are the one telling the story, just, you know, kick it back more quickly. Yes, that is true. You yes, don't I, to... I did spend, I spent a couple years in Korea. Have, have you ever traveled in Korea? Have you been there? And easily, and, you know, send that back quicker. I also just try to, when someone says to me, well, to make a long story short, well, even that's not very short. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go from that to some horrificness. <laughs> oh, that comes soon. And now, another tale of board gaming horror. Oh my, that's horrific. Gather round, children. I recently had what I consider to be a horrific moment regarding Marvel Champions. I have all the content for the game. And it had become clear that the base box and red skull is not the ideal storage solution for the game. So I started to look for suitable alternatives. I came across a miniature chest of drawers from Ikea. I bought two sets and took them home, only to find that the drawers didn't really work. As well, they fit two rows of cards in each. My cards are sleeved and it meant they pushed up against each other, and putting them away easily was impossible. I took all of my cards out, packed up the drawers, and returned them to Ikea. I then found another solution that worked really well, and began the process of transferring my cards to the new storage solution, only to find that I was missing a stack of cards. Specifically, all of the Rise of Red Skull villain decks, 
and the once-and-future Kang scenario pack. After an extensive search of my house came up empty, a light bulb went off, and I remembered that combined in one of the drawers from Ikea, I had Rise of Red Skull villains and once-and-future Kang. So essentially, I had returned the drawers to Ikea with all of those cards, sleeved, packed tightly together, never to be seen again. I called Ikea, who had not either noticed nor documented the cards, so they are likely either in a bin or repackaged with the drawers, sitting in a shelf in Ikea or in someone's house who bought my returned set of drawers. My storage solution budget was then increased to include repurchasing both sets, which on the plus side now means I can go into battle with two Hawkeyes or spider women. <laughs> two Hawkeyes or spider women! <laughs> <laughs> that's, here, that's like a really. I, you know, I, I was reading through this, I was like, eh, and I was like, wow, that actually is. You know, the flip side of this is that story, like, this is like a tale of joy when you oh, if buy you a piece of furniture from thing. somebody. Yeah, and, and, and you this open guy, it. I don't sleeve like, my card, so it was a perfect solution for me. And look, I got free expansions. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it makes it worse that uh, that you know that likely whoever ended up with them cares not a whit for them. They probably threw them away. They probably are like, who? oh, golly, I don't want this. Toss them. <laughs> they, or they give it to their kids. Here. Yeah, uh, here, here you go, some Stick marble on your stuff. bicycle. You like these. Yeah, put them in your bicycle. <laughs> Do kids put cards in bicycles anymore? No. I, th- I, I doubt that I'd even know. <laughs> Not sleeved cards, that's for sure. No, but I mean, like, do kids put cards in bicycles to make it sound like a motorcycle? That was all, I did that all the time when I was a kid. You put know? Gloomhaven cards in. <laughs> We've got a bunch of Pokemon cards that aren't worth anything. All right. Well, anyway, I find this to be interesting. As a side note, as a side note. Side note. I disagreed with you strongly, Eric, when you first pushed your shelves, your new shelves. What are they called again? Uh, oh, uh, Besta. I've been looking into them some more. Oh, really? Maybe. Tell me more. Maybe. I'm sensing there's some there's some interesting uses for these. I Okay. I can see why people like them. The biggest problem with Besta by far, though, is the price. Sure. It is more they expensive, are, and you have to buy the shelves separately from the frames. I don't like that. I, um, I don't like but, that either. So I'll say that. So that's I'm going to give Eric that point. Now let me give Eric uh, 97% more points. Okay. Um, so little did I know how small the minority I was, folks, but I will admit it when it comes to abbreviating Ticket to Ride. <laughs> yes. Did you see the poll, Eric? I, I did. I saw, well, I saw the Facebook thread with a lot of – I didn't see if there was a poll. Yeah, it's on the Board Game Geek forums, okay. and there's a poll, and out of the several hundred people who voted, only four voted for T2R, yep. and one of those four was me, because I wanted it to look at least slightly better. <laughs> it's got to be at least have a respectable showing. Yes, I, oh. I believe I was correct on the abbreviation of Ticket to Ride. No, yeah, I'll admit that for sure. I mean, I didn't, I just, I guess I've just done it for so long. How do you abbreviate Thursday. Uh, oh boy, like, is there an S or is it just a TH? I use an R for Thursday. When I THR? I'm, no, I just use an R. If I'm just using one letter for days of the week and abbreviation, I used, we, I did this all the time as a teacher. It would be M T W R F. Uh, okay. That hurts my brain, but okay. Yeah, it's weird, but. I was not the only teacher in school to do it. I saw someone else do it, and I thought, yeah, I guess that makes sense because I don't get Tuesdays and Thursdays mixed up. Right. Um, I mean, you often I, you often see T for Tuesday and TH for Thursday. That That's true. That's true. So maybe I'm I, – I take nothing for granted at this point. I'm probably wrong about everything. <laughs> I, I, I will admit I have never heard of using an R for Thursday, but 
Whatever well, works. I just opened up another poll, I think. I... Anyhow. <laughs> and yes, folks, I know that Saturday and Sunday are both S's, but that didn't come in the equation because as a teacher, it didn't. Right. You, and, you didn't use Saturday, Sunday. And and if, for the record, if, I would say S-A and S-U, but yeah. Yeah, but again, we sometimes we would use Saturday, but then it was just an S. But all right. Sure. Anyhow, let's go to questions and see what else I can get wrong. Yeah, I have questions. 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 Phil says his board game is expanding. His, his board game group is expanding into tabletop RPGs. He wants to get a good character voice going, but he's struggling with it. So does Eric, the master, the supreme ruler of voice <laughs> acting. <laughs> oh, golly. Have any suggestions or tips or like video recommendations? Would Eric ever consider doing a series about this? That's actually something, I mean, I don't think, no, that's necessarily Dice Tower-ish, but you could yeah. probably, you've read enough books now where you could probably do a YouTube series on voice care and things like that. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I could, could probably do something like that. Um, it really depends on what you're going for here, Phil. Um, are, are you trying to just do silly voices? Are you trying to create uh, diehard characters with, with vast backstories? I think... If you're you're struggling with ways to just play with your voice, um, make a bunch of inanimate objects in your house talk. That that often works for me. Um, try and inhabit. You know, what would this pen sound like if it could talk? What would my pet cat sound like if it could talk? And and just fool around, have fun. You know, don't don't get too self conscious and uh, and and trust that you know maybe some weird noise is going to come out of your mouth, but. That can often lead to having something memorable and fun that you can use at the table at your next RPG session. All right. I just used the voices I did for my stuffed animals when I was a kid. Yeah, that works. Uh, Spicy Jack says, in your latest podcast, you talked about how expensive it can be for someone new to the hobby to get some of these bigger games. You also mentioned, oh, by the way, Spicy Jack says, hi, new to the hobby. You also mentioned the robust used game market. My question is this. Why are most of these used games priced so closely to the original price of the game? As an example, I can buy Wingspan on Amazon for about $50. But in the Board Game Geek used market, the average selling or asking price is about $45. Call me crazy, but A, that's not much easier to buy, and B, when you factor in the shipping costs people ask for, it actually becomes more expensive than to buy new from Amazon. What gives? And why are some users actually asking more than what the game sells for? This used market actually seems to kind of stink. Okay. Um, partially, well, the example user is Wingspan, which is constantly out of print. <laughs> hmm. um, so partially, a lot of the games you're looking at, and I would imagine, are very hot games. And the people who are selling them are trying to get their money back as much as hmm. possible. For them... Packaging it up, shipping it out, it's a pain in the neck. Um, if you look at games that are not quite as popular, maybe, like you picked one of the hot, the biggest, hottest games of the year. Yeah. They often are cheaper, especially if you go back six or seven years. You can get some really nice games for some pretty low prices sometimes because people are just trying to get rid of them. Your best right. bet is to wait to the time where meetups happen again and cons. Yes. And you can go to like a flea market of sort at a con you can get a lot of games for a pretty inexpensive price as long as you don't mind that they're not the newest, hottest ones right now. Right. Or when that second edition comes out, yeah. first yes, editions the first editions get really suddenly expensive. are cheap. I was just thinking um, about this with the, I forget, like, well, for example, Cleopatra and Side of Architects, big new mm. expansion, you might go back and get the original one. Correct. Uh, another possibility for why prices seem to be higher than they should be for the used market is that um, they've those prices were set based on MSRP when the game first came out. And that person is now like, well, I paid $70 for this game. So I will uh, 45 seems to make sense. Um, you know, or they'll 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 set a price when the game is still very popular and harder to get. And they haven't adjusted it based on more discounted prices as games become more widely available. Um, it could just be that they just haven't adjusted the price. They put up a copy some time ago and it hasn't changed. Um, yeah, I don't know that it's fair to compare 
Joe Blow selling his game to Amazon either. Right. <laughs> Very true. If, and if Very it's available true. on Amazon, then buy it from Amazon. I mean, I mean, if if if, if you're looking for price. Yes. I mean, what's the point um, of buying it used? I'm, I'm talking about the big expensive games. They will eventually be sold for a cheaper price. True. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I agree, Tom, with conventions are, are where you will find a lot more inexpensive games. Um, I know that I certainly price mine to move uh, and, and trying to get rid of several of them at once. Um, and I'm not necessarily trying to maximize the profit on every single one. All right. Buddy from Arizona says, what is our opinion of murder mystery games like Hunt a Killer, Murder Mystery in a Box, etc.? Oh, how to host a murder? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't done many of these. I did one in college that was the Star Trek The Next Generation one that I had a good time with. Um, they're, they're almost half game, half, um, you know, well, obviously it's a party. It's, it's a social engagement more than a, a solid game puzzle. It's not really designed for gamers. Um, it's designed for folks who want to have a fun-themed party. Um, so I, I'm all for it. I think it's a great social, uh, you know, structure. And uh, like like Jeff said, it's a it's an excuse to get together and have a a wacky evening or a mysterious evening of of mystery. Uh, so yeah, go for it. But I I wouldn't necessarily if I was going into one of these, I wouldn't be looking for. Well, all right, I am I've got all my ciphers ready. I am ready to find every little clue. It's much more of a social gathering thing. I I I don't know what it is. Maybe someone can explain it to me. I have a hard time getting over the fakeness of it. Hmm. I don't know how to explain it. If I go play a role-playing game, I am playing a character, but I'm Tom Vassell the entire time. And I'll get into playing that role and stuff, but every once in a while I'll be like, I'm going to go get a drink of water. And I don't say that in my character's voice. I don't go uh, to the kitchen acting like that character. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm playing that character in the game and I'm being silly. But to be the character the whole time, I have, a, I have a hard time taking it seriously. And maybe once I did it, I could get into it. You know, I don't know. But that's always kind of put me off. It just It's almost a little embarrassing. I don't know how else to explain it. Yeah. So now that we've answered uh, that question that I totally derailed on my own, I'm, I'm looking back at Buddy's question. He's talking about the, the murder mystery boxes that you see advertised on Facebook. Uh, well, to hunt a killer, oh! murder mystery in a box. Which so <laughs> those are different. Those that's are a escape totally room separate games. thing. Those are, that, those are basically right. escape room games and more thematic, immersive escape room games. Uh, where sometimes you'll get like an envelope in the mail once a week for a month or something, and it will have clues. I've never done one of these more immersive sets, so I, I don't really have an opinion on it. But I think if you're a fan of escape rooms or puzzle games, uh, like the exits or unlocks, then yeah, it's probably up your alley. But I can't comment on any of the specific I've systems. I've done one where we were chasing down a, a person, and I actually just had someone email me and asked me to review one, and I told mm. them I just couldn't do it. It's just too much. Um I, I like a single and done shut case and mm. I don't want to, I mean, if it's a one and done thing, I'm fine, but, uh, I, 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 the ones that are continuing ongoing, I'm not as interested in also, right. and this might just be me. I'm not in that group of people who likes watching law and order SVU and then <laughs> sit there. Like when I, I, I like watching law and order S, SVU after the first 10 minutes. Because usually they're describing some grisly murder. Yeah. Or worse, you know, really depraved things. And sometimes that goes throughout the episode. And I'm like, oh, oh. And that's kind of where I'm at with some of these hunting a killer. I don't know that I want to like you found part of the person's finger. Like, oh, yeah, yeah I'm not real on board with that. Yeah. But that, that's a me thing, right? I'm just not interested in that. Okay. Sorry for derailing. That was I. We answered a totally. We answered question. two questions. Two for the price of yes. one. Two for one. Christopher says, "I was hoping you could take a moment to talk about the business side of the dice tower. I might be the only person actually interested in this, but I'm sure there's a lot of moving parts to manage, from conventions to fundraising to human resources to production. Not to mention the pesky business of actually, you know, playing games. It seems like you'd all have to be pretty versatile." 
I guess my question is what the biggest surprise was for you, Tom, as a business owner who grew your game reviews in a forum to the multimedia company it is today. What were some lessons you had to learn the hard way? Any advice for people who are beginning to see their own companies ramp up? What are the things you dislike the most about running your company? Also, I personally would be interested in the logistics of the Dice Tower as a company. Do you contract out your administrative departments, accounting, legal, human resources, payroll, etc., to other companies, or hire part-time staff to take care of it? It seems like you would be wading through a lot of paperwork and contracts almost every day, what with all the venues you're arranging, vendors you're working with, and sponsorships you have. Now let's get Finally, positive. Finally, these recent podcasts that look back 5, 10, 15, even 20 years ago had me thinking. The Dice Tower really seems like it has grown to the point that it might outlive Tom Vassell's working years. Has there been any thought about the <laughs> legacy of the company in the long term? All right. I'll answer the last question first. No okay. I, I think about that sometimes, but I usually prep the Dice Tower a year or less ahead of time. So it's hard for me to think. When you say Tom Vassell's working years, you can just leave out the word working. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, at some point I'll turn the dice tower over. But if something happened to me now, my wife knows who to give each part of the dice tower to. Ooh, We're splitting it up in like a divestiture situation? Well, no, like but it. like, for example, you would be running the podcast. Ah. If I die tonight, folks, you know who did it. <laughs> how would I do that? I'm Anyway. I don't know how you do it. We were just talking about those murder mysteries. That's true. <laughs> I haven't played any of those. So I don't know anything about it. Um, okay, so let's go back. There's a lot of questions he asked. I, I'm, I'm not going to get into everything here, folks, but here's some, some basic stuff that he asked. Um, the biggest surprise, like, um, I, I outgrew my game reviews and turned into a company, yes. And there's a lot that goes on with that. He wanted to know, for example, what my what my least favorite thing, like the thing I dislike the most straight up is paperwork. I hate paperwork. Mm. Oh yeah. I hate any aspect of paperwork. I've always hated paperwork and there seems to be more and more of that all the time. Now I do farm some things out. I have a payroll company. Payroll companies are not that expensive mm -hmm. and they are so worth it because they handle all the taxes. They handle yes. everything, but that yes. doesn't preclude me from, I still have to go in there and make sure it's working right and do this and change this and do that. And, and taxes, which is the worst part. Although a dear listener of the Dice Tower offered their services this year, and I really, really appreciate that. They're my favorite person of the year so Ooh. far, and that includes nice. my family. That's how important <laughs> that was. I hate taxes. So that was a big mm. thing. Um, other than that, most of the administrative part of the Dice Tower I run, with the exception of the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter is a huge <laughs> undertaking. And so Kenny... His runs, he, he handles that for the most part. He handles the logistics. You know, he, he runs things by me all the time. And also the conventions are a huge logistical thing. And so each of the conventions has a head of running those. So there's a lot of stuff going on in that regard. Um, lessons I learned the hard way. I, it, it takes, it took us a long time, a long time to convince publishers to work with us in any way other than sending us a game. Hmm. And, you know, it, it always cracks me up that this still shows up sometimes on the internet. Like, people review games to get a free copy. But they don't realize how inexpensive it is for a company to send you a review copy of a game. Hmm. Let's say the game costs 50 bucks. It might cost the company 12 Yeah. So they spend 12 plus shipping to send you a game. If they sell two copies of that game, they've made money. So that's really good. Board game companies yeah. are just like me. They're running on really low budgets and things like that. So they don't have a lot of money. So you have to convince them that it's worth it. Yeah. The biggest thing I discovered with the Dice Tower, I think, was the old adage, you have to spend money to make money. Huh. And I've done that. I've always put money back into the Dice Tower. I spent money buying booths for us at conventions. I mm -hmm. believe I'm one of the few podcast video people who do that. And I did it back when I was much smaller than I am now. And I like to be clear, I'm still really, really small, folks. <laughs> we may seem like a big conglomerate. We're a really tiny company. But yeah. even when I was there, 
that's not cheap to buy that convention space, but by doing that, by spending money, I remember back in the day I bought Dice Tower magnets and Dice Tower yep. flyers and whatever I could think of, I spent money in different ways and you it comes back. It it does. Not always. Remember those uh, Dice Tower CDs that no one ever bought? <laughs> the, the, putting the first several episodes on a CD? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's things like that that you learn the hard way. Not everything works. But to me, the biggest thing I find is you need to let something go for a bit to see if it will work. And then you need to reevaluate if it's worth doing. Also, don't run things into the ground. Sometimes people go, I miss you used to do this show. Yeah, but that show kind of got to where we were done with it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I definitely still play games and I definitely still do reviews, but there's a good chunk of my day. I mean, I already I yelled at my wife every once in a while, like I am hiring a secretary at some <laughs> point because I spend sometimes two, three hours a day on emails. No. And going back and forth with different people. I'm sure I'll learn and get better as time goes by. And, you know, I learn different rules and different things. And there's there's a lot of things I'm not going to say on the show because, you know, some of this stuff is just, frankly, it's none of a people's business. But it is something I think about consistently. I'm constantly looking at bank accounts and budgeting and taxes and accounting and all mm-hmm. this other stuff. It's not thrilling, you know, but... No. But... I work hard at it because I want the Dice Tower to succeed. I want us to do well. And I, it's no longer, it's not the a Dice Tower, the place it is now. It's not a thing I can just go, meh, I'll do something else. I could do that. But there are many people whose jobs depend on the Dice Tower now. Yeah. So that's my favorite party game. <laughs> All right, last question here Um, from Adam. Adam says, pretend that you could put a game in a time machine and send it back to when you were an appropriately aged child. Is there a game that you wish had existed when you were a kid Hmm. or a game that you think would have a different experience then? Is there a game you would send to your younger self the same as a top game in your adult life? So he mentions... I, actually, he mentions the Batman Chronicles of Crime, and I, I don't know what that is, but that sounds amazing. There is no Batman Chronicles of Crime, but that I would, would be cool. Buy that in a second. He must mean the Batman Chronicles. Yes. This is a Something tough like one. That. My my first thought was like HeroScape. Sure. Because I know well, some people were thinking that was when we were kids. Me and Eric are older now, so this was I right. was I was out of college when HeroScape came out. By the way, yeah. side note here. I bought at a I or I won a, a a copy of HeroScape that did not go into my huge collection of HeroScape. And yeah. I've been sitting on this for a long time here at the house. I don't know what to do with it. And the other day I was like, let's play this. I'll give it to Jimmy to mess with. Ooh. You know, so he was building some stuff with, but you know what? That plastic is no longer indestructible. Oh, some it is starting to snap now. Some of those pieces. Oh, like the terrain pieces. Yes. Oh, I know. Anyway, uh, HeroScape would be one uh, that Marvel United game I'm playing. Yeah, that would I was be, actually oh, thinking of that word as a kid. I, that would be awesome. I would even say Magic the Gathering. I didn't have that as a kid. It came out when I was in college as a kid. Yeah. Man, I would have sat around making decks all day long. Yeah, I I would say Pokemon for me. Um, that would have been pretty awesome as a kid, and I'd be like, "What are all these crazy characters? This this doesn't exist in any other form. What what is this?" And then I'd like patent it, and then I would rule Pokemon. Um. Okay. Yeah, that's why I'd send it. I'd send like some cool IP game back in time, and and then oh, young me word. would be like, "Wow, this is amazing." And I'm the only one that has it. No one ever has ever heard of this before. Yeah, that's that's my plan. All righty, folks. Those are our questions. You got any good questions? Send them in to us. But let's keep moving. Support for the Dice Tower comes from The Op. Presenting Scooby-Doo, Escape from the Haunted Mansion. 
a Coded Chronicles game. It's time for a mystery, Scoob! Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion brings the escape room experience to the table with Coded Chronicles. This thematic and immersive co-op game takes the players through this new mystery with the gang as they solve the mystery at the Haunted Mansion. Designed by Sen Fung Lim and Jay Cormier, this mystery is brand new to the Scooby-Doo gang and feels just like an episode from the show. Each character has their own unique ability and narrative guide. You will definitely start talking like the characters in this game. Coded Chronicles is an at-home escape room style game where players work together to unlock clues and solve puzzles. Each game offers a unique storyline and objective. Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion is available now at theop.games or your local game store. It's a dice tower top ten! The Dice Tower's top ten list is brought to you by Game Nerds at GameNERDZ.com. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Why indeed, Tom. Why? Well, folks, we're almost at the end of the alphabet, but why is an interesting letter? We're going to talk about fewer game uh, games. I was surprised at this one. Yes, th this was a trickier list than I thought it would be. There's a game that did not make my... Actually, didn't make Eric's either. You must not have played that game. There's a game that's my number 11, but don't worry, folks. It made the people's choice. So oh, when, good. Go, yeah, when you haven't heard it. Looking you know what? There's nothing else to say here. Let's just get started and talk about sweet potatoes or yams or I don't know, something. Let's get going. <laughs> Okay. Number 10. My first game to talk about, number 10, is Yukata, which is actually the namesake of one of the online gaming sites. Uh, this is a sort of a Mayan-themed abstract game. Uh, you're, you've got seven cards, and uh, you're, you're doing numbers and actions and, and leapfrogging your stone along a path and collecting stones uh, and, uh, and trying to earn the most points possible. I haven't played it a ton, which uh, is just goes to show... Um, how how slim the pickings were for for this list, but it, it was an interesting one with some tough decisions, uh, and available on yukata.de. That's yukata number ten. My number ten is a party game I picked up years ago in a terrible pentagon shaped box called You've Been Sentenced. Hmm, um, you've been pentagon sentenced. Pentagon shaped box. Yeah, well, you know, at the time I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, shaping sh uh, shuffling pentagon shaped cards are are awful. Anyhow. You just get a pile of cards that have a bunch of words on them, and you have to make a sentence out of them. That's it. I mean, there's, each word gives you points. And what's interesting is there will be five words on the card, so it might have run, ran, running, to run. You know, they'll have different versions. So making a sentence isn't as hard as it sounds. Um, and I found it to be amusing. Um, and that's why it's my number 10. You've been sentenced. Number nine. My number nine is called Yardmaster Express. Uh, it's a game where you're you're creating, like, trains, uh, sort of clusters of colored cards and trying to earn points by by creating clusters of them and, and making long trains. Uh, it, it, it's, it's Express. It's a nice quick one and, uh, and a, a fun, puzzly sort of game. Yardmaster Express, number nine. It is possible, folks, that some of you played this game, and it's called Backyard Builders Treehouse. Yes, I did. I was I was actually looking for what the newer version was called, and that is exactly what there it is. I was looking on Board Game Geek, and Backyard Builders Treehouse is right there. That's from Green Couch Games, I believe. Yeah, they're essentially the same game. So Yardmaster Express is out of print, as far as I know. The company's gone. Yes. Um, so that would be the one to find. But yeah, it's it was it's very light but enjoyable. My number nine is higher on Eric's list. I'll let him lose. Number eight. And that's exactly what happened when I played my number eight and Tom's number nine, Yggdrasil. Uh, the, the theme is that you've got the great world tree and you're trying to protect it from evil forces. And uh, this is a co-op game I, I sort of bounced off on a little bit. It wasn't one that I, I wanted to add to the collection. But it's, it, it is, um, you're... you're you're, you're trying to manage threats as they, they come and attack the world tree. And uh, it is, as Tom said, a difficult one. Yggdrasil. Yeah, I, now, to be, just so everyone understands, I have not played the newest version of it. Mm. I've only played the original one. At the time, I was like, this game's really hard. Wow, mm. nowadays I'd probably go, well, it's kind of in the middle of the pack. Lots of, no, maybe. Lots of cooperative games are hard. I like the theme of it. It was the 
Odin theme, but it wasn't Marvel. It was kind of more traditional, you know, straight up uh, mythological lore. But Yggdrasil is pretty cool, and it came out before. It was one of the first cooperative games, so it holds some, you know, special spot for me because of that. Yggdrasil. My number eight is higher on Eric's list because he got to the airport before me. Number seven. I was pretty sure that my number seven was going to show up farther along Tom's list, so I knew I wasn't going to have to talk about it. But it was possible that Tom was going to put it farther back just to mess with me because he thought I knew that I wasn't going to have to talk about it. But then he thought that I knew that he was going to put it back there, and so he decided to put it forward on his list so that I wouldn't have to talk about it just to mess with me. My number seven is Yido. (laughs) Yido. Now, here's the thing. They actually came out with a new edition of Yido. I've not played it yet. This is bugging me. I know that there's a new version. I never got a copy of it. Yido mm. is the gamer's version of Lords of Waterdeep. It takes place and you send out workers to get weapons and get trained so that you can send uh, on missions. Very similar to Lords of Waterdeep. But mm-hmm. there's some more, you know, the more things going on in it. I really like the game. There's a bit of some clunkiness about it, which I wonder if the new updated, nicer new version has fixed. So I really need to hunt that down. But I like the theme of it a lot, like send out people on these ninja missions and get them all prepared or samurai missions or whatever. It's really cool. A neat looking board. Yedo, Y-E-D-O. I don't think I've played Yedo. Maybe I I, I don't know that you have either, but. Yeah, I don't think so. Number six. Number six is Ispahan, uh, a game with, with, this was one of the first ones to use dice in unconventional ways, or at least in the Euro gaming field. And I was like, oh, it's a Euro game with dice, but it does it in weird ways. Um, you are, you're claiming spaces uh, along a, a street, and uh, there's also camels that stretch along the street, and, and you're drafting dice. And the more die results that show up uh, in a particular, you know, the more threes that show up, the more powerful that action is going to be. Um, and you're, you're trying to manipulate, or not as much manipulate the dice, but ride the wave of what luck has dealt you in a particular round. Uh, Ispahan, number six, fun game. Another game that's been reprinted, <laughs> you can now, or of sorts, Corinth from Days mm-hmm. of Wonder is a roll and write version of Ispahan, right. which I'm told is quite similar. <sighs> My number six, Eric stole it before I could get it. But that's okay. Mm. I'll get him next time. Number five. My number five was Tom's number eight. That is Yukon Airways, a a fairly recent game, although time is weird. Uh, This debuted at a Essen 2019, so it's actually not that new. Uh, Oh, wait a minute. This came out during the quarantine. I remember that. I I know I played. No, it came out at Essen 2019. They might have been demoing it there. Maybe. No, you could buy it there. Uh... Hey, future Eric here with, um, I guess, settling this debate. Uh, The game did come out in 2019, October 24th, 2019, which would have been during Spiel 2019. Just, I don't know. I I guess I knew I was right and I wanted to make sure you all knew too. Back to uh, past Eric and Tom. Anyway, um... (laughs) It is a pick-up-and-deliver game set in the Yukon Territories. Uh, And it's more than just pick-up-and-deliver. It's sort of like route building, um, and it's got upgrading of your plane. It's it's a much more complex game than simply getting from point A to point B. Um, But it's... uh, it's a rewarding one, and and the production is very cool with your dashboard and ways to upgrade it. I liked it a lot. It's my number five, Yukon Airways. Yeah, there's a lot of neat things about it. It has some interesting things. I I worry that the replayability might run out after a while, but just the picking the different upgrades will keep you occupied for a while in Yukon yeah. Airways. Eric put East Behan as his number six. My number five is shorter and more succinct. It's just East, Y-S. It's the same company. In fact, East was their first game. I think East Behan may have been their second. And for a while, they were trying to stick YS in every game they made. Yeah. They've since calmed down. It got, it got a little convoluted. East is a blind bidding game, half blind bidding. You're putting half your markers face down, the other half face up. And then you're trying to get gems and buy and sell these gems. Uh, This one's a little higher on the list, if only because it has a lot of nostalgia for me. I like a lot of things this did, even if I haven't played it for probably a decade 
or so. I would like to see this one redone like East Behan was. So that's East. Number four. You know, for being an old game, Yahtzee doesn't get talked about a whole lot, but it's actually a pretty solid roll and write game. And the mechanism of the triple die roll and keeping the dice you want to keep has been implemented in tons of other games. But specifically for this list and for Tom's number six, as well as my number four, uh, we're talking about Yahtzee free for all. I was surprised you picked this one. (laughs) Uh, no, this this is one, in fact, that you raved about a lot, and I tracked down a copy to give to my mom uh, as a birthday gift because we, we played the classic Yahtzee tons, and, and we really enjoyed this one as well. This uses, like, betting chips uh, that you claim for completing certain combinations of dice. So uh, it's more of a race game. You're not, you're not just focused on your own individual score sheet, but you're trying to claim the point chips for completing certain combinations. And uh, so it feels like you're more involved uh, on, on all the different turns. Yahtzee free for all, my number four. It's definitely more interactive too. Yeah. You know, in regular Yahtzee, it doesn't really matter. You, you, you could just play a bunch of solo games and compare the scores. Yes. I think Yahtzee gets a bad rap. I think it's a pretty decent game. Like Eric said, yeah. I think it's better than many of the new modern roll and rights, actually. But Yahtzee Free For All is my favorite, which is why it was my number six. Hmm. My number four was Eric's number seven, and that's Yomi. Yomi was one of the first fighting games brought to the board game. You like the Street Fighter style games, it's clearly based on that. Yeah. You each have a deck of cards. It's a literal deck of cards with aces and you know the clubs. You can has the different suits on it. But it's a very big rock, paper, scissors game. And then each deck has uh, leans towards a specific style. And then you just got to try to beat the other person's deck. You're doing a little bit of fighting back and forth. It's pretty fast. It's fallen for me a bit as the years have gone by. But I still like it a lot. So that Yomi, my number four. Yes. Uh, I mean, I like the uh, it, it's the Yomi term specifically refers to the stuff I was alluding to earlier, where I think Tom's going to make a particular move. So do I counter that or do I know that Tom's no- going to know that I countered that? And we go as many iterations as possible for that. Uh, or maybe I just don't have a counter for what Tom's going to do. And so there's my decision right there. Right. Number three. Number three is Yunnan. For me, this is this is a worker placement game uh, that also involves Hunan. Yunnan. <laughs> I see what you did there. Um, Yunnan. It's in the Yunnan Peninsula. Uh, it's a worker placement game, but you also have sort of a journeying aspect. In fact, I think you have to save some of your workers uh, in order to go on the journey. Everybody that you don't place on the worker placement spaces then can go on a journey and move along. And the farther you go on the path, the more points it's worth as you do this, building buildings and going on little pilgrimages. I like it a lot. Um, it's a it's a neat twist on the genre. Uh, Yunnan, number three. My number three is your bluffing. No, your I'm not. Bluffing, yes, whatever. I don't believe you for a second. Your bluffing is a classic game that's been out for a really long time um, and in it you are basically making trades back and forth between players giving them face down cards but there's a lot of zero cards and so essentially if someone makes you a trade you can decide to take it or make them a better trade back and forth And but sometimes they give you six cards and I turn them over and there's four zeros there uh, the scoring system's wonky the card game is silly but I really enjoy this one. I think it's held up over the years. That's your bluffing. Now that I think about it, I think this game has come out in many other names as well. And I think I may have owned it at one point. It's possible. I uh, I forget the. You may have the, uh, no, by the uh, German name. It wasn't there was called. A, there your was a German with, with cows and chickens and stuff. Yes. Um, I'll look up the name while you talk about our next one. Okay. Number two. And when Tom says our next one, it's because we have synced up uh, on this one. Our number two is Yokohama, uh, another worker placement game that has a geography to the worker placement spots. You actually have to move your workers around, uh, not a grid. It's sort of an offset grid um, and and moving them around. um, And that geography is kind of a cool twist. To, to the system. And different buildings and different arrangements each time you play makes it for a, an, an interesting challenge in Yokohama. Yep, I agree with everything Eric said. It is a big game. Doesn't feel that big, though. It's very manageable. You don't have lots of workers. You have one who's roaming around the board doing different yeah. actions. 
but it feels really good. I like it a lot, Yokohama. Back to your bluffing. Uh, the game was called Kun Handel. Kun Handel. I did. That's the one I had. K-U-H-A-N-D-E-L. And yep. we called that because there was not an English version for many years, but it came out in 85. Wow. So it's a pretty old game. Okay. And finally, number one. My number one is uh, the distillation of Tigris and Euphrates. This, instead of using squares, uses hexagons. It's a Reiner Canizia title, Yellow and Yangtze, uh, which I, I like. I, it is, I mean, I already loved Tigris and Euphrates. Um, this, this adds some nice twists, um, changing and tweaking some of the, uh, the, the tried mechanisms, tried and true mechanisms of Tigris and Euphrates, uh, and making it work for some new New shapes, new directions. I really like it. Number one in the in the wise, Yellow and Yangtze. It is a solid version, and I think, I don't know if I like it better than Tigers and Euphrates, but I could. It depends mm. on the mood I'm in, I think. My number one, easily, Yinch, which is all capital letters, Y-I-N, Y-I-N-S-H. Yep. It is an abstract game, which apparently Tom Basso does not like abstract games. But anyhow... You want to put five in a row of your colors. So you are just moving rings on the board. And you every time you move a ring, you put a piece of your color, white or black, in that ring. But any pieces you jump over flip to your color. That's it. But it offers some great strategy choices. It's really fun. This is one that I, uh, I, I immediately thought of as we were putting the list together. And I went, wait, I haven't played Yinch. <laughs> like, I know it. I know of it. I, I've seen it but I've never, never played it. All right. Um, let's take a look at the people's choice. So number 20 was Yam Master. What? Now, I, I actually thought when I first saw this that it might be yarn because maybe the R in the end. You know, if you put an R and N too close together. I do know this. I encounter this many times. Right. So, um, but no, it is Yam Master. It has nothing to do with yams. It looks, it's, it's basically a spinoff of Yahtzee. Huh. It has nothing to do with yams. It's called Yam Master. It doesn't have anything to do with But it might be yams. like yam. I don't know. All right, I number- am what I am, and that's all that I am, and that's a Yahtzee clone. <laughs> so um, number 19 for the people was Yunnan. Then number 18 was Yokai no Mori. Uh, this is a game that came out in 2013. Hmm. Huh. It's a simple version of Shogi. Okay. All right, 17. Yinzi, the Shining Ming Dynasty. 16 was Yggdrasil's Chronicles. This is the new version of Yggdrasil, and I permitted this to be separate because it is, as far as I can tell, a different game. Number 15 is Your Town. It's a very, very, very big town. Um, Mm -hmm. Your Town. uh, Number 14 is Your Bluffing. Mm -hmm. 13 is Yahtzee Deluxe Poker. Wow. I played this. It's another version of Yahtzee with some poker elements thrown in. 12 is Yellow and Yangtze. Surprising, this one's not higher, actually. Yeah. 11, Yido. 10, the people agreed with us on Yahtzee Free For All. There we go. Nine, Yomi. Eight, East. Seven, Yukon Airways. Six, Yggdrasil. Five, here's the game neither Eric or I put on our list. This is my number 11, I swear, Yamatai. Hmm. The Big Days of Wonder game that came out after Five Tribes. Right. No, I haven't played this one. It did not get the same amount of love Five Tribes did, uh, but I thought there's some pretty good things in it. It just didn't make my top 10 here. Number four, Yinch. Number three, East Bahan. Number two, Yokohama, and number one, and a big surprise to me, Yahtzee. Well, I think this is one of those situations where it was relatively high on many people's lists, and so it just filters to the top. That makes sense, Eric. I am learning from you. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know, and again, I, when I when I think about the classic games, Monopoly, Scrabble, Yahtzee, Clue, and all of them. I yeah. usually I'm like eh, on most of those games, but not Yahtzee. Yeah. yeah, I probably want to play a lot of games over Yahtzee, sure. But I have definitely played Yahtzee, especially electronic Yahtzee. You can just sit there and go, da, 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 yeah. you know, and push your luck and stuff. I don't know. And triple Yahtzee is my preferred way to play it, if possible. I like casino Yahtzee. 
But that's a different game entirely. Yes. That starts with a C. Yeah, it We does. should do our top 10 Yahtzee variants. We're not going to. We should. Um, but hey, folks, we're almost done with the alphabet. We got Z, but we won't be done quite yet because then we're going to numbers. But we're going to oh, do just... Yeah. We're just going to do numbers. We're not going to do one <laughs> symbols and then twos. <laughs> oh golly! I'm you know it's going to be hard enough for me to do numbers. I think. No, I don't think so. There's a lot of games that start with dates. Yeah, that's true. We'll see. All righty, folks. Well, thanks so much for listening. There was a lot of nice feedback we got in episode 700. We read it, and we've been getting a lot of delayed feedback, <laughs> and I appreciate yes. that. No, I appreciate the nice thread that people started in the forums. Um, and so we're constantly trying to work to make this better. I hope you, you know, I saw all the stuff about my sound. We're trying to make that better. Uh, forgive us. There's a lot of moving and things going on, but we'll get there. And hey, we made it to the 700s and we didn't stop. But so, no, we didn't. We didn't get stuck. All righty. Well, keep talking to us in the forums. We appreciate that sort of thing. Lots of things to go on. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to the Yash Tower. Wow. Yeah, that was that was pretty bad. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 704 was recorded on April 1st, 2021. Tom joins Mandy and Suzanne for next week's show. And in two weeks, we go back 20 years with a look back at 2001. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with assistance from Rob Searing, Mike Delisio, Roy Candide, and Chris Yee. Box-shaped digits at the end of your feet provided by QB Toes. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Game Nerds, your all-in-one solution for all your nerdy needs at GameNerdsWithAZ.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Tom at Dicetower.com or Eric at Dicetower.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including Board Game Blitz, the Portal Gaming Podcast, the Family Gamers, Board Gamers Anonymous, the Broken Meeple, the Game Pit, and Dice Tower Tonight. Find your next favorite at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. Okay, I know we usually do something silly at, after the credits, but uh, one more recommendation. If you are a video gamer and you have a PlayStation and you like puzzles, The Witness is absolutely free right now. If you, you go to the Play at Home uh, at, on your PlayStation store, it's very fun. You're exploring an island and you're solving cool logic puzzles, and I'm really, really liking it. The Witness, it's called. Get it. Also, Clifford the Big Red Dog is a kaiju and would beat King Kong. What? Why? <laughs>